All right. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you and talk about Sweetwater Wetlands, one of my favorite spots. Uh, my name is Luke Safra, I'm the Director of Engagement and Education for Tucson Audubon. And uh, our mission is to inspire people to protect and enjoy birds. I always find that the best way to inspire people is to be with them. So we got to be with each other, whether it's virtually like this, or even better, being on location at Sweetwater Wetlands, uh, where I've been inspired by many of you uh, throughout the years. So uh, today we are going to dive in a little bit to some of the things that I've learned uh, about birds birding and birders at Sweetwater. Uh, it's um, not real much of a technical presentation. It's uh, meant to uh, just uh, be kind of introspective a little bit and fun and, and hopefully inspiring. And I wanna hear from some people who are with us uh, on the call as well, not just myself. So we'll have some opportunity for other people to share. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna share my screen and uh, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, just an overview of the Sweetwater Wetlands, a map of where it's at. So like um, this is one of my favorite maps of Sweetwater. So here's Tucson here. And as you scroll down in, you get to see like all the different ponds and they all have different names. So this last pond here on the west is a shoveler pond. You have the Keyhole Pond. You have gazebo pond. So like this is the map that we use to like figure out like, all right, I saw this scissor tailed flycatcher at the keyhole pond. Well, what's a keyhole pond? Well, it's it's this one right here. But this is the map of our place that many of us have explored together. It's a small area. Uh, it's something that um, yeah, you can just take a couple hours to to go around and walk around or it could take all day. Just depends on how you want to do it. Uh, so I wanted to make sure everyone kind of got a visual look of here's an overview of Sweetwater. And here, let's go over to my presentation. Boom. Okay. All right. So <laughs> I had to start off the presentation with a picture of people. It was really Sweetwater. I mean, there's such a variety of birds there. It's amazing. Like you go any time during the year and get at least 35 to 55 species. Um, but even more than the variety of birds, there's a huge variety of people that, that have uh, explored that area with me and with uh, Tucson Audubon. This is a, a picture from, I, I believe, in November of 2019. And we're all holding up our little elegant Trogan uh, Tucson Audubon stickers. Uh, we're going to uh, come back to this specific date. This is the Wednesday before Thanksgiving in November of 2019. Something really special happened that day. So we'll go back to that. But it's just a, a picture of, I mean, there's a lot of people who are involved who have um, attended uh, Tucson Audubon walks there. Uh, many of you, it's your first touch point for Tucson Audubon. My first touch point with Tucson Audubon was actually here, and it was Wednesday. January 21st, 2015. I had just moved here from Washington State at the end of 2014 and had gone to Sweetwater a few different times. Uh, did, done a couple of Talking emails. about um, here, Sweetwater. Put it on there. All right. There we go. And um, so, but my first walk was about three weeks after I arrived on January 21st, 2015. And actually, I went back to, um, eBird and I found that checklist. Let's find it. Uh, ooh, don't get that away. All right, here it is. January 21st, 2015. Uh, for some reason, I only put one. It, there was other people there with me. Um, saw 46 species. And if you scroll down, well, see, actually, before you scroll down, look how I submitted it. Submitted from bird log NA. I wasn't even, this is so long ago, I wasn't even using the eBird app yet. So lots of things have changed since then. If you scroll down, another thing that's changed, which is kind of funny, uh, is so on that day, we had what's rare for eBird anyways, uh, Casson's Kingbird. This time of year in, in January, it's kind of tough to get kingbirds at different spots in Tucson. They're very um, 
uh, specific locations where you can see cats and kingbirds in the winter, like Reed Park. That's that's one that I usually go to. But on this date, we had one uh, fly over at Sweetwater. And I put a whole bunch of notes in here for this cats and kingbird. Bright yellow belly kingbird seen during the weekly TAS walk with Brian Lichtenhan. He was the, the leader at that time. Perched on the dead top of the dead snag, ruled out Western kingbird, ruled out tropical kingbird. So here's something that has definitely changed since my first time at Sweetwater. If I had seen a cast and kingbird this year, back in January, I would just write something like Cassin's kingbird <laughs> in the description. It's funny how like when you first start birding, you, you feel like it, and maybe I still should, you write out all these descriptions of like this bird because like you're afraid of the eBird police, like really, you know, dictating things and all that. And uh, I've grown less afraid of that and just um, maybe my note taking hasn't, hasn't really, um, maybe it's deteriorated is what I'm saying. But anyways, it was kind of fun to look back. This is, yeah, my first Tucson Audubon field trip and Eber list. And uh, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, 466 checklist total I've had at Sweetwater. It's not the most anyone has had at Sweetwater. If you go on eBird, you can see that Molly Pollock, uh, she recently moved to Green Valley, but she lived here in Tucson for a while. Uh, amazing birder, eBird reviewer. She's had well more than 466. I have 217 species. That's not even close to the most either. You look at Andrew Kaur or Mark Stevenson, Molly, much more. So it's just um, accumulation of uh, you know, eight years of leading the trips is kind of where I'm at. So you can kind of get a feel for, for what I've experienced there. And, uh, I've got, I've got 11 life birds in my time at Sweetwater. Uh, anything from a common gallinule to prothonotary warbler. So uh, ones that we see there all the time, we see common gallinules all the time, prothonotary warbler, like one of those rare Eastern warblers that just come. But uh, yeah, so many of you have live birds there at Sweetwater too. Uh, here's another here's another picture. You know, just got to get as many people pictures in there as possible. I, I believe this is from 2017, 2016 or 2017. But back when uh, we didn't have limits on how many people could attend, and uh, you know, we didn't put limits on how many people could attend until after. Uh, COVID in 2020, we put those limits, but we'd regularly have 30, 40, 50, sometimes 60 people show up. And uh, it was always fun to uh, get pictures of everyone when, when that was the case. And uh, so th this is just one of those and just seeing the faces of people uh, is, is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the things that I've learned at Sweetwater actually come from people in these pictures not just the birds that we learn from it's mostly people that we learn from that that's I one thing I've, I've noted yeah so uh, and but it is the birds that i probably uh you know for majority of us uh, it, it is the birds maybe it's not for me but I, it is and it isn't right so what about birds so one thing i learned about uh birds from the eight years that I've been at Sweetwater is they all have their time. They all have their like distinct timing that um, we can kind of start to um, predict when we're going to see these certain birds. Now I learned this a little bit. So back before I started leading walks at Sweetwater wetlands, uh, when I was living in Washington state, I led a field trip along the Yakima river uh, on the Yakima greenway, the pop-off trail. And uh, I did that for about three years. So I started to see these different um, timing and just uh, being able to think about when great catbirds would come, come back to Yakima. I begin to know that. That was just for three years. So not like not a lot of data to go off of. But after eight years, you start to see even more and even more. And so here are a few birds that I've uh, just to think about timing. And uh, this really came to mind again. I was already thinking this this way as I was preparing the presentation, but yesterday at Sweetwater, uh, one of the guys was asking, um, hey, wh when do you think we're going to see Western wood peewees? And so I include Western wood peewee here in a 
in a slide coming up here, but one that really stands out to me, a bird that I love to just welcome back uh, every year to Sweetwater, and that's Tropical Kingbird. This is a great kingbird picture by my friend Dan. Dan was on that very first walk that I did back in January of 2015. A lot of these pictures will be from Dan. Uh, but the tropical kingbird is like a very special bird that you don't get to see in very many places around Tucson, but Sweetwater is a great spot for them. Amazing spot. And so I have went back into all my records from 2015 through last year to see when uh, my first record of tropical kingbird was. Now, take this with a grain of salt because like I'm not there every single day. These kingbirds come in at different times and um, you know, if, if you looked at all the reports from Sweetwater, you would have an even greater, um, uh, precision on when tropical kingbirds arrive. But, um, this is from my own, my own observations. So like if I didn't have eBird, see, I, <laughs> eBird almost makes it too easy because, um, you could go look at everyone else's records, but think before eBird and you're learning these birds. And you just have your own rhythm and siding log to go off of. And so uh, I, I think we can learn from both methods. So he, here's what I saw from mine is like anywhere from May 5th to May 18th. That's when you're going to see tropical kingbirds arrive. So like next week, next week, Wednesday, I believe is going to be May 3rd. If I, if, if I, if I'm correct. So like, uh, there's, a, a maybe a slim chance that tropical kingbird might arrive, but if you're there at the Sweetwater walk on May 10th, when actually I won't be there, I'll be in Ohio, but May 10th, you're going to have a, like, you might see the first tropical kingbird to come back, uh, to Tucson. So, um, that's something I noticed all these birds have their time. So here's Western wood peewee, May 2nd and May 19th, every single year. Um, that's when you're going to get Western wood peewee. Here's another really interesting one. They're not all like when they uh, first come back. Now, some birds, they don't, come, they don't come here to breed. They just pass through. Well, here's willow flycatcher. I've had 20 sightings of willow flycatcher at Sweetwater Wetlands, but I've never had one in the spring. Never. Maybe it's because I overlooked them. Maybe I'm sure there are other people I've had sightings there in the spring or winter or definitely not winter probably but always you can count on willow flycatchers every year to show up between august 12th and october 2nd so that fall migration so you begin to see these patterns of like when to see birds they're always coming back i was looking at ring neck duck uh, a lot of you know that i love waterfowl i love ducks and ring neck ducks when they're coming back it's always late september early october and so now that after eight years you can kind of see these patterns that birds have their timing they know when they're going to be there um and so that helps us in our birding knowledge of like all right this is what i'm looking for this is when i can go there um it's just really interesting and that's the beauty that's really the beauty of like birding one spot over and over and over and over again uh, those spots that we don't get tired of that we can go back and look at that. And there's just, um, yeah, if, if you're about learning, you're about knowledge, you're about like experiencing that, that pretty neat. Now, as I said, it's not all about birds. I think one thing that I've also learned from eight years of Sweetwater, uh, birding is just more social than we realize. Um, I love that. Uh, I try to make it that way. And I, I hope I, I really want to inspire many of you to to see birding as also a, like a, a social event, a, a way to uh, move people and to be moved. Um, this is one, you know, over the eight years, I can't tell you how many people uh, have um, led with me or carried a scope with me at Sweetwater not to mention all the people who have come to participate, but a lot of people who come to participate, they turn into leaders, they turn into uh, volunteers, they turn into donors, they turn into all these people who have this uh, wide array of gifts and talents and um, 
generosity towards Tucson Audubon and the birding community. This is one of those guys, one of those, those people, John Sarton, he would always carry around a scope and um, still it, it, haven't seen him as much lately, but he's still doing good. And, um, but would always carry a scope and help out here. He's not carrying a scope. Well, let me silence that. He's not carrying a scope, but he's carrying a, a, a bird skull that he found on the ground. <laughs> it's always like, um, always fun to, to find things out there in the wild. Uh, but John, uh, John just kind of encapsulates what it means to, uh, birding and, and the social aspect of it. Here's another, another look at, uh, is Andy Larson and Steve Vaughn, and they both at different times helped out, uh, so many, in so many ways with the Sweetwater Walks that, uh, have helped lead. Here they are. This, this is a, uh, an event that we put on called Tucson Meet Your Birds. I don't know how many of you uh, ever attended a Tucson Meet Your Birds. I actually, before I was on staff, I volunteered at one of these, one of the gateways to Tucson Audubon for me. And uh, we would all gather at Sweetwater. There'd be a bunch of different vendors out front there. We had food trucks at different times. We had people set up all around the wetlands where uh, folks could walk around and have like little birding learning sessions at different spots around the wetlands. I would love to do something like this again in the future. Um, and it, it it's where a, a lot of people had their first connection again with Tucson Audubon through Tucson Meet Your Birds. And uh, yeah, it, it, it even moves even beyond Sweetwater and, and birding. Uh, here, this is a, a Christmas Eve at my house back at, I think it was 2018, but you can see Here's Tom Brown and his wife, Jeannie and Louise, Scott Crabtree, Tom and Scott both led so many times with me at Sweetwater. And even Scott was there on Wednesday, uh, helping it, carrying around the scope. And it's just birding bleeds over. At least I think it should. That's what I, I I've learned about birding while at Sweetwater is that it bleeds over into air, all other areas of, of life. Really. Um, it's, going out and looking at birds with people is more than just a will of flycatcher or a Western wood peewee. Well, especially more than those because they, they don't have any color. They're kind of boring, but it's even more than a, than a painted bunting. You know, it's like, um, there's a lot more when it comes to birding, birding, you know, um, there's definitely a, a time for birding on your own, but birding with other people, I, that's really where it's at. And that's what I've learned. So, <laughs> One of the first volunteer things I did with Tucson Audubon outside of just leading the regular Wednesday morning Sweetwater Walk is I started taking school groups to Sweetwater. And uh, I think the first one I did was back in 20, like uh, fall of 2015 with Apollo Frere Freedom School. Uh, always a lot of fun. Man, kids, kids love the outdoors. It, that's a, I mean, I kind of already knew that already, but um, leading groups of kids at Sweetwater, man, it's such a different area than you find anywhere else in Tucson. You got cattails that kids just don't see all the time around here. You would take it for granted. I moved from Washington State. You know, there's water, there's rivers, there's ponds, there's cattails everywhere at different times, at different places. But here in Tucson, you, you just don't see that. So when a kid who uh, lives in Midtown or you know lives in someplace in Tucson where they're not around water and stuff, and they go on a school trip to Sweetwater and they see cattails and like, the, you know, what are those corn dog things growing up out of the on that reed? You're like that, you know, it's a it's a cattail. Uh, so you get to look at that with them. This is Ken Kingsley. Uh, he's showing uh, some kids a saguaro boot. We actually, there aren't really any swarrows there at Sweetwater, but we had these different stations set up, um, stations about plants, stations about hearing birds, stations about drawing birds and all around uh, the wetlands. And so Ken and Amy, they were at one of the tables and showing the kids these different things that they could see there. Um, but uh, I've learned that part of sharing birding and sharing this, uh, a place you love, Make sure you're sharing it with kids because um, they love that kind of stuff. This is uh, my son, Brock, and our friend, Mooney. 
and uh, Mooney's from Libya. He, uh, uh, he came here with his family as part of a asylum seeking uh, family. And so we did some stuff with them and uh, Mooney loved going to Sweetwater and he loves snakes. So like uh, that was a, a summer where there were a lot of snakes out of Sweetwater. So you got to be careful at Sweetwater, especially this time of year, because there are quite a few rattlesnakes, but um, getting kids out there outside looking at snakes and birds, like there's, uh, yeah, there's nothing like it. Uh, so another thing that I've learned <laughs> from my time at Sweetwater is that as birders, sometimes we take ourselves too seriously, take ourselves too serious. Like, you know, we're all about having the checklist and, e you know, making sure our eBird report is correct. How many red winged blackbirds did you see? Was it 37 or was it 32? Uh, and, you know, what was the weather for the day and putting that in our, in our little checklist and um, thinking, oh, wow, you know, we got to make sure we're very correct on all these things. We got to make sure we're quiet. So we're not scaring the birds. And that, that's definitely true at times. But here's the thing. Here's what I've learned at Sweetwater is that we can't take ourselves too seriously. And this is, uh, I think, a, a pretty explicit picture of not taking ourselves too seriously. This is uh, Halloween of 2018. Wednesday happened to be October 31st. So like I was thinking, all right, what should I really dress up? Should I really do that? And how are people going to respond to that? You can see most people out here pretty excited. I don't know about, I can't remember his name. He, I don't know if he's excited about this. You know, I don't know if Carrie is or not. Uh, but most people are pretty excited about it, you know, and realize that, hey, yeah, birding is fun. Uh, think about that with my job all the time. Like, hey, this is a, this is a fun job. Don't take it too seriously. And at Sweetwater, we kind of are able to get away with that. There's a, a wide variety of people, some new to birding, some who have been birding all their life. Uh, but it's... Um, you know, the urban habitat is kind of uh, lends itself to remembering that, hey, we're out here to enjoy ourselves, so let's just enjoy it as best we can. And uh, just so you guys know, this is not normally how I dress. I uh, Dressing up for Halloween, I just wanted to make sure to connect the dots with everything there. And uh, yeah, so I've learned that. Hopefully you can learn that too. If you haven't already, I'm sure you have. It's old news to you. So an, another, th so th here's a bird picture. So moving away from some uh, people pictures. So I, I had to make sure to throw some more birds in here. One way that I found to not take birding so seriously is, and to share it, make it even more fun and enjoyable for people who, uh, they may just be getting into birding is coming up with, with fun names. So, uh, before I explain what this is, so this green wing teal, um, we have three different teal that we can expect at Sweetwater, especially really during like the, the March through May, uh, early May timeframe, maybe February through early May, uh, blue wing teals are mostly here. Like late February or March through early May. We had a couple on Wednesday, a couple blue wing teal. But the goal in that time frame is to have the teal trifecta. Now, this uh, this way of expressing the teal trifecta was brought up to me by one of the school groups that I led. And I was really excited. And uh, the kids, maybe not so as excited about seeing blue wing teal. And we had a green wing teal. And then we had a cinnamon teal. So here's green wing, here's cinnamon, and here's blue wing. And when you see all three of these yeah, together, the country, can. Okay. if yes. you can guess what it's called, it's called the teal trifecta. One of the kids came up with that name. And then as soon as we had the teal trifecta name, everyone seemed to get more excited than just saying, oh, we saw three types of teal. Like the kids didn't really care, but you, you've, introduce a, a fun name to it teal trifecta uh they were all hooked and um e the kids actually even wrote like um follow-up like thank you letters to us 
And not all of them, but the vast majority of them mentioned their favorite thing being the teal trifecta. So uh, what I've learned from Sweetwater is uh, not to take ourselves too seriously and to come up with fun names. So if you can ever come up with a fun name, it kind of helps to uh, uh, helps to get other people excited about it too. I know when we first when I first started doing the um, the bird walks with the guy who was leading them at first, and his name uh, Brian Lichtenhan, he he was always going for the five heron day. So five herons that would be like great blue heron, black crown night heron, green heron. And then he would throw in great egret and snowy egret. Now, if anyone can help me come up with a, a better way of expressing a five heron day in some like really fun way, like teal trifecta, uh, just hit me up with how I can express that. What I have also seen from uh, my years at Sweetwater is that we get a lot less herons now than we used to. Having a five heron day back in 2015, 2016, 2017 was, I mean, it wasn't common, but it was, yeah, it wasn't likely, but it wasn't like totally uncommon either. Um, nowadays, we're lucky if we get one or two of those. Uh, and a lot of times it's a flyover. So what I've seen there is that there's something with food sources, or maybe it's uh, the cattails are just tall and we don't see the green herons as often. Um, but I, I do think it's something of food sources. So I haven't, I haven't, all, all I've learned there is that, um, bird populations change. So and I don't have a slide for that, but that, that's free. Uh, all right. Okay. So these next couple of slides also go along with not taking ourselves too seriously. Big thing. As I was going through all this, that's a big thing I really learned from my eight years at Sweetwater. Uh, what I've learned from eight years, you can clap for rails. Uh, it was the first time that I've ever seen anyone do that or heard of anyone doing that. Um, Larry Norris. Some of you know Larry. Big, uh, he got a big white beard, glasses. He is. Uh, He's a hoot. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, he is a hoot. And so like, I remember the first time I met him at Sweetwater and he was birding with us. And uh, he asked me about clapping for rails. I can't remember how the conversation went. I was like, what are you talking about? And so what did he do? He like, well, watch this. And he just went, clapped his hands really loud. And then you know what happened? After that, this happened right here. And if you've ever been to Sweetwater, you, you know that sound. That's the dolphin sound, right? That's the, that's the sound of a, a Sora. That's this bird right here. That's what a Sora sounds like. And uh, Larry would clap. Soras would go off. Virginia rails would start doing their pig grunting. American coots would do their, all their weird calls that they do. And I was like, wow, that is so awesome. And so uh, I don't do it as much as, anymore. There aren't really as many sore Virginia rail that respond to that. I don't think there's as many rails out there either. Um, but I would do that with the kids. Like when I was uh, leading different field trips with the kids and you walk through the, one of those little settling ponds there on the North side. And I, the kids, would, <laughs> I'd be like, hey, you guys want to hear something cool? Have you ever clapped for birds before? And uh, you just like see the wheels turning in their minds and like, what is, what is he talking about? I'm like, well, watch this. And we do that. And I don't know if they were, I think they were excited. I think maybe they're a little weirded out, maybe a little too. But um, yeah, that's something I learned from my eight years at Fleetwater is that you can clap for birds. You can clap for rails and they'll respond sometimes, sometimes. Um, <laughs> I had to throw this in there. What I've learned from my eight years of Sweetwater. There is no such thing as a white hawk in Tucson. So you may not 
understand this reference, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it. This is another thing from Larry. If you ever met Larry, uh, let's say you're uh, out there uh, on one of those uh, little looks at look out over the over the water and you have the the railing around you, you know, to protect you from falling down in the water. Well, he's the type of guy who would be like, hey, uh, have you seen the rail over here? And they're like, no, I don't see the rail. It's like, oh, well, you're leaning on it. Yeah, you would do that kind of stuff. Well, a couple of years ago, uh, they cleared off the the north side of the road from uh, Sweetwater Wetlands, and there's a bunch of like uh, vehicles in there now, um, construction stuff. Kind of, there's some vehicles parked out out there. There's also a big trailer parked out there. Now, this trailer. Let me get over here. This trailer is, uh, I don't know if it's a 2018, but it is a White Hawk trailer. So you can see right here, there's on the side of the trailer, it says White Hawk right there. So there's a big White Hawk trailer sitting on the north side of the road. And one day, one day, oh, uh, Larry, Larry said to us, he said, have you seen, you guys see the White Hawk over there? And I'm like, I'm looking, I'm like, I don't see, I don't see, I don't see what you're talking about, Larry. And I, I had heard of White Hawks, a White Hawk, you know, they're down in like South America or whatever. So I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, it's right there. It's right there in front of you, just on the other side of the fence. And I'm like, no, I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Well, he was talking about this trailer. <laughs> and, uh, so he, now I try to pull that off every once in a while because that White Hawk trailer is still there. I think I pulled it off all right on uh, Wednesday uh, morning. And uh, I try not to pull it out too often. I don't want to reuse the same joke over and over. And I don't deliver it as well as Larry did that first day. But um, but yeah, there's no such thing as a White Hawk in Tucson. Oh, this also reminds me of another time when uh there used again on the north side of the road there was uh not a not a stuff but like there was a a decoy of an american crow that used to be on one of the fence lines back by one of the ponds on the north side of the road and uh the first time we ever laid eyes on this we we had it in the scope we were looking we were looking what is that bird what is that bird finally we realized it was a a crow decoy. <laughs> oh boy. Like I said, I've learned we can't take ourselves too seriously. Here's another thing I, I've learned from eight years of sweet water. And some of you have probably seen this before, but pie bill grebes love bullfrogs. So this is a picture of a, a grebe with uh, the feet hanging out that Dan took a picture of picture of the grebe with the frog. And, um, you know, it's, uh, Never ceases to amaze me how a pie bill grebe can swallow a bullfrog like this. Some of you have seen that in action. Uh, maybe you haven't yet, but anytime you go to Sweetwater and you're looking for grebes, see if they have any bullfrogs around them. Uh, they they love they love these guys. But along with grebes loving bullfrogs, another thing I learned is that um, don't pick up bullfrogs when you're out leading and guiding a walk there's a few things that i've picked up i i showed you the picture of john with the the skull of the of the bird i'm not sure he should have picked that up especially without hand sanitizer but this bullfrog i was able to grab one time i don't know how how i was able to catch it but just real fast you know and i picked up this frog dan got a picture of it there's another time where we found a uh a, a, a turtle had died and I, I, sh I shouldn't have done it, but I picked up this shell of the turtle and uh, it was one of the nastiest things I've ever touched in my life. And it turned out there's all sorts of stuff and, um, but I didn't have any hand sanitizer with me. So I've learned not to pick up things if you don't have hand sanitizer. <laughs> all right, okay. So what I've also learned from Sweetwater, my eight years there, is that there's always going to, 
surprises happen. There's always a fun surprise. You never know what's going to happen. And this might be my favorite surprise that I've ever had at Sweetwater. It was this, it was a white ibis. Boy, I don't know if you've ever seen a white ibis or not, but this, I always imagined a white ibis being a lot wider than this one right here. And so I remember this bird flying over. At first, I, I remember exactly where we were at. We were um, kind of on the north side of the ponds. The selling, oh, I, I'll even show you. We have that map. I'm going to show you. I just want to show you. We were right here, right in this area. Um, and all of a sudden, we see this birds start to fly over. It's a fairly big bird with this decurved bill. And what is that bird? Dan always has his camera. It's clicking away. Uh, all these different pictures and like, ah, I don't know what that is. And I'm like leading this filter, but I had no idea what this bird was. was like, ah, I'm like, it had a bill like an ibis, but it wasn't a white faced ibis. Like, what is that? Uh, someone was carrying a bird book and we pulled it out and we're like, oh, well, maybe it's an immature white ibis. And uh, so we look at Dan's pictures and sure enough, immature white ibis let's see if i can i have okay yeah it was july 5th 2017 and my son was with us brock was with us andy larson was with us here dan we had 34 species and look here here are the more pictures that dan took this is what it looked like when it was flying right over us it never stopped it just kept on going but dan was so quick like this is the weirdest bird i've ever seen in my life what is this thing and it, sure enough, it was like one of the, I think it was the first report ever of white ibis at Sweetwater. I think it might be the only one ever. And uh, wow, how amazing was that? And uh, so that was, that was a fantastic day. You can see the, the notes here. I, I, I've also learned that putting notes in your Eber list, as I go back and look at some of these, boy, it's so helpful when I put notes in here. So uh, I put notes in here for other animals that we saw, raccoon, coyote, including pups, a rock squirrel, and then uh, also a beautiful roseate skimmer. So I even looking at dragonflies that day. Um, but yeah, surprises are so good. Another surprise that really stands out to me at Sweetwater. Oh, hey, I put the roseate skimmer picture in here. Dragonfly. Uh, uh, I found a Kawati one time at Sweetwater. And again, the, the field trip had already ended. And I think I was going to go look for a, a Baltimore Oriole just before I had to get into work or what. Actually, it was 2015. So I didn't have work to go to. That's what it was. So I got finished up the field trip. I didn't have anything else going on. So I went to go look for this Baltimore Oriole. Looked up in this cottonwood that I was scanning for the Oriole. And what the heck? a Kawati up in the cottonwood. And so uh, Dan hadn't left yet. So I ran, got Dan and said, Dan, come take a picture of this. I think I have a Kawati. And he comes over and gets this picture. But holy cow, what a neat surprise that was to have a Kawati at Sweetwater. I'm sure many of you had different surprises uh, that you've had in birding experience, but um, just the joy that comes from a surprise like that, that's something I, I've learned over the years, such a, such a good thing. You know, you go and you have over 400 checklists somewhere, but you still get surprises like all the time. Such a good feeling. Here's another thing that I've learned from my years, eight years at Sweetwater. Pandemics may stop us momentarily, but not entirely. <laughs> uh, here's uh, our friends Dutch and Marlis, and they got you can just see this is the only picture I could find with us at Sweetwater with our masks on. But you remember, uh, we shut down Sweetwater walks starting in March of 2020, and then we started up all these different virtual events. But like, I just wanted to get out there and be with people, I just had to be there with people, and uh, thankfully. My buddy Tom, like he, same way, like let's figure this out. So 
we limited it to really small groups. It was just a leader and six people. And we were wearing masks outside. And uh, so that's how we started in June of 2020. This is, yeah, they're looking at, at, at a roadrunner that's right here on the, on the pathway, real close to us. The roadrunner was not wearing a mask, but we were. And uh, then we had to stop them again in February of 2021 for a little bit when it was a little dicey. But um, I'm just thankful that we found some ways to, to still make it happen. You know, um, getting together and burning together, that's just something uh, we've got to adapt and find new ways to, uh, to do if, if uh, something like that that happens. So I'm very proud of the way that we handled that, uh, in a very safe way, but also in a, you know, just, uh, trying to prioritize what we need to do and getting together with each other. So, um, yeah, that, that that's a big thing I learned that how much I really appreciated birding with people at Sweetwater in, in general. Uh, here's another picture of a dragonfly. <laughs> <laughs> I've learned dragonflies are cool. I I had paid no attention to dragonflies before I birded at Sweetwater, but uh, the guy who led before me, Brian Lichtenhan, I remember the first the the first time I pulled up to Sweetwater and he had his little uh, ukulele out. Like I would, I wish I could talk to Brian sometime and just see how he's doing. But he had a ukulele out and he was playing like, uh, oh what over the rainbow or something like that. I think over the rainbow is what he was playing on his ukulele in the Sweetwater parking lot uh, before the field trip. I was like, wow, it's a pretty interesting dude. And uh, then as we're walking around for the field trip, he carried a, um, like a net, you know, one of those nets that you use to like uh, get butterflies or dragonflies and stuff like that. He loved dragonflies. And so later in the year when the dragonflies would come out, we'd spend as much time uh, netting different dragonflies and trying to identify them as we would birds. I say that half jokingly, but it's almost true. This is a rambler's forktail. I had no idea what a rambler's forktail was until Brian taught me at Sweetwater. But pretty cool dragonfly. Uh, even went so far as buying a dragonfly book. I haven't broken it out for a while, but maybe I should in honor of Brian and what he taught me in my time there. Okay. I'm going to tell a story. And then I want you guys to have an opportunity to share any stories that you have. Now, this is the most epic of stories. And some of you might have been there. Some of you have probably heard this before. But maybe you haven't. So... Sweetwater stories. I'm going to call them sweeties. So all of us have a sweetie to tell. I call them sweeties. I'm stealing that from my friend Larry. His, whenever he gets a, a new bird for Sweetwater, he calls it a sweetie. So I, I'm changing that to our Sweetwater stories. As you can see here, this is a picture uh, that Dan took of amazing looking barn owl at Sweetwater Wetlands. Uh, I've seen barn owls maybe... Uh, less than 10 times at Sweetwater. Only once since this story. So this story takes place the Wednesday before Thanksgiving of 2019. Back that first picture I showed you where everyone's holding up the little uh, elegant Trogan sticker. It was that day. My parents were there. Um, I, oh, who was I yesterday? Um, on, on the walk yesterday, someone said it was their very first Wednesday that they attended a Sweetwater walk. It was that Wednesday. And so this story comes up all the time. But here's a barn owl. This was not from that day, but this goes along with that day. Here's a barn owl. Here's a, a picture of a great horned owl uh, from, again, from Dan at Sweetwater up in a willow. And uh, so we come into that morning. There's a lot of us there. There's a lot of us. There's like 40, 50 of us. And we break into two different groups. And we hear from someone who's already there at Sweetwater, not part of our group. They come up to us and say, hey, we saw this really weird owl head over here at, in, in this corner. 
here, I'll show you kind of the corner that it was at. So the owl head was right here. There's these big cottonwoods on the southeast side of the wetlands. And they said, hey, I saw an owl head over there, a barn owl head. And I was like, what are you talking about? And I didn't really think much of it, you know, because there's a lot of people and I was talking with others, but kind of put it in the back of my mind, right? An owl head. Okay, well, that's weird. Um, so, um, oh, if I go back to this. So on that day, we split into two groups. The group that I lead goes this way towards the Ramada and around. So that Southeast portion is going to be like near the end of our walk. The other group was going that way. And so I start my walk and start going around. It's an amazing walk, really good time. And we finally make it over to that Southeast corner or actually we meet the other group and they say, like, yeah, we saw the barn out. It's like, what are you talking about? So then we come up there. Sure enough, on the ground, what is it? Yes. Yes. This was amazing. This is a picture I took with my phone. It's a barn owl head. We see it up in front of us. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm just going to go. I'm going to walk out in front and kind of check this out a little bit. So I'm underneath of these cottonwoods looking at this barn owl head, taking a picture. All of a sudden, I hear a commotion up above me and I look up and sure enough, there's a great horned owl flew out of the cottonwood with the rest of the barn owl in its talons. Now, one of, oh, I forgot to change. This is, this picture is not by Dan. This picture is by uh, Ivor. Uh, I need to change that. Ivor, uh, I'm trying to remember his last name. I, Ivor from Seattle. I know that I combined Ivor's seafood with Ivor. But he's been on a few of our different walks. But Ivor took this picture of this great horned owl with the barn owl and his talons that flew right over us. And then it went out over the um, the marsh and we didn't see it again. But this great horned owl had taken this barn owl, somehow chopped its head off, and the, the head was like intact on the ground. And then it flew right over us. It was the most amazing thing that I've ever seen in my life. It was like drastic, drastic, drastic. And um, just really left us all pretty like, whoa, what just happened? So it, the story kind of ends there, but doesn't. Like the next week, I see these remains of an American coot with, look, <laughs> no, no head, no head on the American coot. And we see the two great horned owls right in the same area where this coot is at. Now, the really weird thing is that um, a week later, we also had the great horned owls. But since that next week, I have never seen a great horned owl again at Sweetwater. I don't understand. I, all my records are from like 2015 through 2019, and then they stop. So I don't know if, what that means. But all I know is that it was like an amazing experience and it kind of lingered for the next couple of weeks and then no more great horned owls since then so i have like no idea um but that that that's the story there that's the story there of course uh bobcats this is one of my favorite pictures of bobcat over here from dan and people look in another direction <laughs> like there's bobcats like everywhere we haven't seen the bobcat for a little while but i've heard of other people seeing it there and uh, so, uh, here's a, a picture of me that, um, I was climbing some trees, trying to get a better look out into the marsh. I guess that's another thing I learned is that if you can climb trees, you get a better look. It's actually how I saw my first purple gallinule, not a common gallinule, but a purple gallinule. I had to climb up in a tree to see it and lift my son up there. So he could look down into the marsh and see the purple gallinule. But, uh, it's kind of a, a reflective picture of my time at Sweetwater, but I want to hear from some of you. So many of you have great stories of Sweetwater, or maybe you have a question that uh, I could help answer, but someone share a, a Sweetwater story with us, if you would.
Hey, Luke, does my sound work? I hear you, Tom. Yeah. Hey, I got it working. Well, I'll throw in a quick one. And I guess as much as anything, uh, Sweetwater was my introduction to Tucson Audubon and to you. Uh, so I have dozens and dozens of stories. I could almost do my own show on it. It's like you could. Uh, you should. But I, you the, should. One thing that, the one thing, aside from meeting you and, and gaining an exceptionally good friend, um, the, the group that all got together to tear the water let us out. Oh yes, I totally forgot about that. You know, oh, to me, to me, yeah, sure. And I'm gonna look for some pictures. Okay, for to me, you know, when the water lettuce was the, an invasive species that took over in there and and was really causing some damage, uh, a large group of the people that had gone on the walks with us uh, that you and I had led for you know the previous couple of years all got together. Uh, we had a had a boat in there, and we're all in our chest waders and and trying to rip all that water lettuce out. Yeah. That was I, I to me that's one of the one of the great water um sweet water stories that stands out. Oh man, yeah. That okay. I found one picture. Let's see if I can share it. It doesn't show the water less, but it shows the group. So here here's oh, water less. We <laughs> Bro, yeah, there's Larry too. Chip waiters. <laughs> Oh, there's the old coot there. There's Larry. Larry, yeah, nice. Yeah, uh, that was a great day. Yeah, it really was. That was, that was a lot of work. I, I don't know if we accomplished <laughs> anything, but we definitely, um, uh, yeah, kind of put her back into it. It made us feel better. It did. It did. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, let me see if I can find it. it other pictures, but it, thanks for sharing that, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, anyone else have any? Any sweeties, Sweetwater stories, thoughts, questions? I could probably share one. You know me, never, yeah. never one to not talk. <laughs> um, so the first time I ever saw a Sora at Sweetwater, I actually saw three in one day. <laughs> it's like, I hadn't seen one for all the times I'd been there. And then I saw three and it was the day that I was doing my birdathon with my granddaughter. So she got to see one too. So it was like, gosh, not only did I get to see one, but so did my granddaughter who was learning how to, you know, just starting out as a birder. As the birdathon last, what, two years ago, I think it was. Yeah, two years ago, the birdathon. And um, she, we both got to see the Sora and I got some not so great pictures, but. That was, that's my story for the Sweetwater. That's great, Tina. And I love how it involves, you know, uh, getting other, others involved there. I, I love that so much. It's cool. I see a couple of questions in the chat about like what time the walks are happening now. So we're getting into the hot season. And so in May, our walks start at 6 a.m. So bright and early, um, we've got to do that to beat the heat because it gets hot out there. Um, but there are spots available for people. So like, yeah, I know Sarah can get kind of crazy to, to get on one and uh, they fill, can fill up pretty fast. Um, but there are spots available right now in May. Uh, the June ones will be up here pretty soon. And um, I just want to tell you guys, like if you ever have trouble getting in on a walk and you haven't been able to... Um, to join because they fill up too fast just shoot me an email i'm pretty lenient about the numbers these days so um i can always squeeze someone in i think anyone else have a, a story they'd like to share hi look it's me kathy hey Johnson. kathy oh hey yeah it was you who your first walk was on yeah that that day yes kathy <laughs> It was amazing, my very first Sweetwater trip, and day before Thanksgiving 2019, and we we saw that owl experience. It was it was quite awesome. <laughs> and thank you so much, Luke, for, do, for doing all these trips. They're wonderful. That's cool. I'm glad you're there on that, Kathy. Like, um, you know, I I think. Yeah, I think there was just about like 40 or 50 on that walk, but it seems like there's been like 100 or 200 people have told me they've been there. <laughs> on that walk. It's, like, it's like everyone talks about it. I'm so glad. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, 
question <laughs> is, have there been any break in car break-ins lately? No, I thankfully I have not seen any. So, so that, that's a good thing. Sandy, it looked like you're going to say something. I, I was, um, yeah. I, um, Ohio in here and my first trip out there, uh, have not been in one of your groups, but uh, I have good friends that are naturalists at Sabino Canyon and our first trip out there to Sweetwater. And we've gone many times since is our encounter with the local bobcat. And, uh, so coming, I'm not, you know, just nature in itself is so different from here in the mid Ohio Valley to out there in the Sonoran desert. So we're walking along and right behind us, here comes the bobcat carrying a duck in its mouth as a, just like nonchalant, like I own the place, what are you doing here? So it was quite an eye opener. We've always enjoyed uh, going out there. It's been quite a treasure to uh, go to Sweetwater every time we visit in the winter time out there. And again, thank you for doing this. It brings back good feelings and I can't wait to get back out there this, this winter. Oh, I love to hear that. Thanks, Sandy. It must so, be the Hengus boss that you're, I, I bet you, Gene and Mark. It is. You're yeah. right. It is. Yeah. We always uh, stay near them. We live, uh, we, we rent a condo up near Sabino Canyon. We hang out with them. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. That's a trek from Sabino. So I'm glad you come out there still. So Great. Luke, the, uh, the picture you had of the dragonfly, it's not, the roseate one is a dragonfly, but the other one is a damselfly. There is a difference between them. Oh, the Rambers forktail? Yes. The uh, damselflies have wings that are parallel to their body, and dragonflies' wings are horizontal, you know, perpendicular to their bodies. And I've uh, been on the walks with Jeff Babson, so we've learned the difference between the two. So you're right. That's fine. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Tina, for correcting me. Sure, we can change your. Well, your slide didn't say dragonfly or damselfly, but um, I'll change it is my... a da damsel. I'll change what I say. Yeah. <laughs> Maria, I see your hand. Hi. Um, I just wanted to share the one time when I was uh, birding at um, uh, Sweetwater. It was toward the end of the day, and it was kind of a quiet day. We hadn't seen a lot of birds. And all of a sudden, a million red-winged blackbirds and yellow-headed blackbirds all flew in and were on those um, the cattails that are... Um, not too far from the parking lot, just west of the parking lot. And they were just screaming and screeching and carrying on. It was amazing. We got a lot of good pictures. But I think a better story for that is my husband's. Uh, do you remember me? I'm Maria from Winding Road, uh, yeah. from Birds of North America. So yep. anyway, so you remember my husband, Tony, who was in the play. And uh, he rode his bike from our house in southwest Tucson to Sweetwater. And he forgot his bike chain. So he leaned oh. the bike up against the bathroom and he went in there to go to the bathroom and he heard the tick, 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 like somebody rolling your bike backward. And he jumps up and he runs out there and the bike's there and everything's fine. And he hears it again and he turns around and there's a rattlesnake right at the door, right at the door to the men's room. He stepped right over it in order to get out of the bathroom and probably to get in. He didn't even notice it. <laughs> But it noticed him. So wow, that, that is awesome. <laughs> that was scary and awesome at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> but I wonder if he would have uh, rather it been someone taking his bike than like walking over a rattlesnake. I don't know. That's... No, no, I think he was thrilled with the rattlesnake. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> uh, thanks for sharing that, Maria. You bet. Thank you. Very cool. I, I don't want to cut anyone off, but I just want to say, you know, it's only it's only been eight years. You know, we could have a lot more years in front of us together. So I'm really thankful for that. Hopefully see you guys out at Sweetwater and we'll make some more uh, sweetie memories. And um, we might not see a great horned owl uh, decapitating a barn owl like we we have in the past. But but who knows what could be out there? Um, just uh yeah scissor tail flycatcher maybe clegg you know we talked about that at the beginning that would be a fun one uh but there's uh, there's a lot out there so thanks for being a part of tucson audubon thanks for uh being a part of inspiring people to protect and enjoy birds and uh for yeah, being part of this community um let's see let's uh let's close it up we'll have 
have a great rest of your day and a good weekend. Oh, if you haven't, uh, Tucson Audubon's Birdathon, that's a big thing that's going on, finishing up here in, in a week or two. Um, so check out Tucson Audubon, uh, the Birdathon page, and see how you might get involved. So have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. See you later.